Hello and welcome to the AI Digest. My name is Joaquin and I'm your host. With me today is Raul Jose. Jose? Please, please correct okay. me if yes. I'm mispronouncing. Jose, okay. Spot um, on. It threw me off a little bit because your name, um, it seems Spanish. It seems like Latin. Uh, but you were telling me that um, Joe's is actually a common name in, in South India because of uh, the Christian is. missionaries coming into the area. Mm -hmm. So whenever people get uh, my second name wrong, I tell them that it's sort of the short form of Joseph. <laughs> That's how I prompt people into pronouncing my name right. It's interesting. Um, small world uh and uh yeah we're all connected in some way right um so just to get on with your background you are uh a programmer in the future leaders program uh of uh, mm -hmm. GlaxoSmithKline India um can you tell us a little bit more about what um what that program is the future leaders program yeah so uh, I think I can just start with my company itself, Glasses and Klein, but I, uh, it's, just, it's a fairly big company. It's a global biopharma company that uh, has its portfolio spread across a lot of diseases, infectious diseases, HIV, uh, respiratory and immunology, and oncology as well. So specifically, I work under the biostatistics vertical in research and development for GlaxoSmithKline. And I, I, I'm under a program called Future Leaders Program. So essentially what that program is, is that it's a program designed for graduate students. It's an early talent development program, uh, wherein they're taking graduate students and sort of help them accelerate their career. So uh, that for me, it's in the form of rotating through three different teams over a span of two years. So basically meaning that I am in one team for eight months, I move on to the second team, team work there for eight months, and currently I am working with my third team. And yeah, I can go into more details about that as we go on. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, pharmacology and what, what that is, what that entails? Oh, yes. So, uh, so again, I work in the pharmaceutical domain. So pharmacology essentially is... Uh, sort of the scientific study of the effect or the efficacy of drugs, basically meaning that how, how well is a drug responding in your body or how well is it doing the things that it, it's intended to do in your body. Uh, and uh, that essentially is what pharmacology is. And pharmaceuticals essentially mean, uh, meaning agents or drugs that are used for medical purposes. You might have like uh, heard of the word nutraceuticals that have come up very recently which essentially means that nutraceuticals are agents that sort of help us in our nutrition. So essentially pharmacology, ph pharmaceuticals being agents uh, that help, that have serve a medical purpose. So, and GSK being a biopharma company. So I can differentiate between pharma and biopharma if you want. And uh, biopharma essentially is an advanced or a more modern version of pharmaceuticals wherein we use living systems to create uh, pharmacological, uh, pharmaceutical agents or drugs, basically. Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for making that distinction, and thank you for giving us a little bit of context. Um, in in the submission and in, in, in the forms and the emails that we we've been sending back and forth, I see that you are a passionate and curious individual, and. You know, I, I think even in your um, academic journey, you've made a couple of changes. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about where you started wanting to be a doctor and how you made a transition to biotechnology? So uh, I, I, I'm i going to admit this to the public that uh, my decision to want to, be, to for me to become a doctor was rather uh, naive or foolish, wherein I saw a TV series called House MD, and I'm like, I want to be like that guy. That's cool. That's, 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 one that's, one one. Yeah. <laughs> that's a cool uh, show. I know, but I, I dove head on uh, based on one TV show. Uh, like, I consider that the naivety of a 17 year old me, but uh, 
unfortunately during my prep to get into into medical school i ended up getting uh, a, a disease that sort of halted my preparation and the only other uh, sort of accidentally uh, i'd say that i went into bio biotechnology sort of accidentally wherein the only other exam that i gave for university was for the biotechnology course and thanks to my mom for that because i was a very uh, overconfident child uh, very sure of uh, sure that i'd become a doctor or get into a great medical school but uh, there was a disease in between that just happened to uh, divert my life in a good way in retrospect <laughs> um yeah so yeah i wouldn't i, I mm -hmm. wouldn't call that foolish man um just to give you a little bit of uh, a little anecdote from my life in sixth grade there was this contest where somebody offered up ten thousand dollars for somebody to make a hoverboard so okay. in my sixth, sixth grade mind i was thinking okay let me go into the library there has to be knowledge that i can put together to make a hoverboard and nothing transpired from there but I invested a lot more time and energy into physics and, you know, just learning about how how that could be accomplished. And uh, in high school, I did research on physics, uh, cold atmospheric plasma and different phenomenon. But look at you now. I mean, you're in biostatistics in a pharmacology, pharmaceutical company. That that decision put you in the right path, right? It, yes, which is why I was like, in retrospect, it did work out for me well. And talking about physicists, I actually, um, like, there's a widely popular show called The Big Bang Theory, which I watched uh, almost at the same age as you did, sixth grade. And I wanted to become a physicist back then. I was reading up on a concept of mesons and pi mesons and so on. I didn't understand anything, but I felt cool, though. <laughs> yeah, I didn't understand anything that I read either, but it, it seemed cool, right? It's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's enthusiasm that, that drives us. Um, but for okay so in your in your course of study you also had an internship um in in the food technology food science realm what was that yes. about so, yeah so i i'll go back one step and talk about my degree which was uh, it's a bachelor's in biotechnology and biotechnology essentially is uh, sort of a domain that uh, that sort of take that utilizes that talks about utilization of biological systems or living organisms uh, to get to sort of produce a product that you desire. And there are a lot of fields to biotechnology, a lot of subdomains to biotechnology. I can give you an example being medical biotechnology. And what that essentially means is that you sort of take a living organism, say a bacteria, and you sort of start from, from the bacteria to give you uh, a protein that you desire. Say, if you want to make insulin for diabetes, you sort of get the, uh, instead of using these large vessels and containers or chemical containers to essentially uh, make insulin, you use a bacteria as a vessel to make the product. So that that essentially is what, essentially what bi medical biotechnology is and then uh, there are concepts like gene therapy, if you want, I can go into that, and agricultural biotechnology. I saw that there's a guest, there was a guest of yours, I, f I forget their name, sorry, who was talking about AI in agriculture. And yeah, uh, Dr. Yeah. Ron Anchal, he, he was talking about that. Um... Yeah. So uh, even things like that, uh, that falls under biotechnology, which is uh, using uh, tools in biotechnology to sort of get your desired product out of a plant. And if you want to use it for agriculture, you call it agriculture biotechnology. So as I was exploring the various fields within biotechnology, I ended up uh, doing, I, I wanted to see if food bio, food technology was my thing. And food technology sort of is just a branch of science that uh, talks about production of food, preservation of food, quality control of food, uh, and well, food products. So what that means is that something as simple as pickling of food, how you how you pickle your um, uh, food essentially is a way of preserving, and that can fall under food technology. Or even you decaffeinating your coffee can fall under food technology. Or just uh, the way of storing and transporting coffee by freeze drying it, so that can also fall under food technology. 
So now I now a step forward to that is food biotechnology, uh, wherein you sort of use biotechnological tools to uh, you know do the exact same thing, which can be production quality control and such. And I worked in a company that was, and my role was essentially to uh, to make sure that all of these systems involved in production of their food product were uh, working well. Uh, that no bacterial growth was happening and how I go do uh, how I do that is basically to sort of sample uh, different tools and vessels that they use to make their food product and grow it in a lab to see if there there are any bacteria that comes about which means that the food is contaminated or the vessel is contaminated so you I I went about conducting routine tests for that uh, the good part was also that I, in food technology you also go out tasting the food to make sure that it's <laughs> up to par. So that was, that was good. Yeah. So you, you can taste the raw materials, which are dry fruits, the chocolate itself and so on, and then go about tasting the chocolate cake at the end of it to in the name of science. Anything in the name of science. <laughs> Anything in the name of science. <laughs> um, fascinating. Yeah. Um, we take for granted just being able to grab something off the shelf in the supermarket, mm -hmm. uh, but there are so many minds, so many hands, uh, so many different complicated uh, and volatile processes that go into food production, uh, processed food production, safe, you know, safe distribution of food to and from uh, the, the, the site that it's cultivated to the end consumer's house and make sure that it's safe in your pantry and you don't get salmonella from a spinach uh, or, or, or E. coli or any sort of uh, bi biological hazard. Um, exactly. Yeah. So, so I, then, uh, I I did see how much uh, sort of investment goes into uh, building up a production plan for any food product, where you have to invest in a particular airtight, not airtight, but a sterile room, uh, sterile vessels, or you have to change your air filters every now and then to make sure that there are no bacterial buildup there, you have to check the quality of your air and so on. So there's, a, I, I saw that from a scientific point of view, uh, there was a lot of investment that goes into something as simple as, as, you know, like you said, something you take for granted. Especially when you deal with the lives of people, heaven forbid you introduce exactly. some sort of bacteria and some biological product and it festers, people eat it without knowing and they die. I, it's terrible um okay so let's go let, let's move on to what you're working on now uh first let me just say you're based out of india southern india i imagine what what part specifically uh so i'm from the state of kerala which is the southmost tip of india and now i'm working a little up north from kerala uh, it's a city called bangalore or bengaluru okay um so you're you're now working in the space of biotechnology for um well biostatistics for uh gsk right um yeah. there is a couple terms that i just want to disentangle um can you just tell us a little bit more about um bioinformatics yes so uh bioinformatics was is essentially uh, how do you say this uh it's sort of, I, I see bioinformatics as uh, an intersection of computation and biological data, wherein uh, early in the day, before we had as much computer power, computational power as we now do, uh, all of these lab tests that people conducted in the lab that can be human uh, health data or uh, what do you say, the chemical tests or biological tests that you conduct with your bacteria and so on and so forth, or proteins, so on and so forth. You you gather all of these data, but there was essentially no way to analyze the large amount of data that you have. So, uh, and that now comes in computational power, just add computational power and you have all of these, uh, uh, the, this vast amount of biological data, now you have the power to analyze it. So. Uh, so bringing the idea of biological data and computation together, I would say, is the field of bioinformatics. And that was something right after food technology, something that I got into in college. And what so is the converting? 
What is its use? Mm -hmm. where, where is it applied? Uh, yes, so bioinformatics, more, I would say that more in an app, not just an academic setting, but if, if you're talking in the context of clinical trials or drug development, it would be the early phase of drug development, which is identifying a disease uh, with all the data that you have. Here, the assumption that I'm going with is that you have uh, you have identified a problem statement, which is that you have to work with a disease. Now you sort of figure out how can you tackle this disease, which basically is there are a lot of proteins that go around in your body uh, that can go wrong in your body that contributes to a disease. So uh, what, which of these proteins for a particular disease do you target? And what kind of intervention can you do? Well, how do you target this disease? And you have, and how do you collect data so that you get more information on the disease, on the target? And uh, yeah, so at this early stage of drug development, where you're trying to figure out the disease, the drug, the target that you are going to act upon, uh, is where bioinformatics, the field of bioinformatics, essentially plays a critical role. And then uh, you, you mentioned a very important part. How do you measure the efficacy of your efforts? Is that where biostatistics comes into play? Uh, yes. So I would say that biostatistics, at least in this context of clinical study, comes right after the stage of bioinformatics. So I understand that there's a lot of overlap in it. So in very crude sense, I would say that bioinformatics comes at an early stage of drug development and biostatistics comes in at a later stage. Although this, this definition is very loose, wherein biostatistics essentially is just uh, applying of statistical methods to biological data. And, so, uh, and I would say that okay. if, even if you have lab data and you uh, perform, you, you take about a mean for a variable from your lab data, that can also be classified as biostatistics in a way. Okay. Um, and why is it important? Uh, yeah. So a biostatistics essentially is... If, if not in the con, I can also bring about a context of epidemiology and uh, public health. So during the COVID-19, uh, you essentially, with the data that you have on, uh, you essentially apply statistical methods and models to see how your data, how your disease is spreading uh, and then make a, go about making decisions on how you can tackle it. So in a public health and epidemiology perspective, that is how uh, biostatistics sort of plays, uh, you know, uh, an impactful role to stopping disease or in a clinical trial setting uh, how bio biostatistics plays a role in is that uh, now you have all the data uh, from your clinical trial so clinical trial essentially being uh, you have a, a cohort of humans uh, upon, uh, for, uh, and you are using your experimental drug to see how effective this drug is with this cohort that you have this is essentially what, in, in a very crude way, is what a clinical trial is. Now you take this data of how, uh, uh, and this data, data can be lab data, which is your blood work or your ECG data and so on and so forth. And you sort of see how well your drug is doing. And that is where statistics again comes in. With the data that you have, you try to summarize the data to see how well it's doing. I appreciate you making the distinction and exemplifying the different levels of viewing uh, biostatistics because there is the individualized perspective of how is this affecting an individual? How is it yeah. affecting a group of people within a particular use case or in the study of one clinical uh, trial, a pharmacology trial, or mm -hmm. how does it deal with the uh, aggregated um, concerns of, of a population? whether it be, you know, state, town, city, region, country, world. Um, interesting. Um, okay, so let's move to a little bit more of the technical realm. Um, can we define machine learning in the context of this? Uh, yes, so machine learning essentially, uh, this being an AI uh, focus for podcast i'm sure a lot of people have talked about this but then just to uh give you my perspective on machine learning so that you get a little bit more context to what i'm about to say after, post after this uh machine learning essentially being uh, sort of enabling your system to learn and adapt to the data that you have to identify trends predict outcomes or any um, any predictor that you would really want to predict without explicitly being 
uh, or explicitly without you not explicitly programming for it to do that and yeah so that is the context in which i am viewing machine learning so uh, so machine learning if i can give a little bit of background of how how of how i am related to this is that i don't have a conventional background in computer science or anything computer science related i have a biotech background which has very little to do with the usage of other than bioinformatics uh, my degree really doesn't focus on the usage of computational power and how uh, it can be used to leverage data or how you can transform this in data into information so it's something that i've had to pick up during uh, my last semester of college wherein i really wanted to as i was exploring like you said i'm uh, like as we've discussed that i'm a very curious person so after food technology and bioinformatics i wanted to dive a little bit more into the world of machine learning and data science so that was when i i i approached uh, uh, my mentor whose name is girinath pillai uh, who is working in a company called Nairo Research, who owns a company called, who founded and owns a company called Nairo Research. And I approached him with no background in machine learning. And I was like, can I do a project with you? And I was very frank that I have no background in machine learning. And uh, I wanted to take six months to build up that knowledge so that I can get a project out. And he was kind enough to say yes. And that is how I dived into the world of machine learning. So uh yeah so that that is my background in machine learning and my sort of context to it and then during the course of uh, those six to eight months i dove into the foundations of machine learning i would say not extensively but just enough to get um, uh, the ground running because i wanted to get a thesis out of this or a project out of this as well so that is i i went with a very project centric approach to uh learning all of this so that is how i went to uh, machine learning then come then i started with the idea of deep learning which is which can be considered a subset of machine learning uh, where it uses specific algorithmic structures called neural networks uh, that sort of can handle a high level of abstraction sorry for this a little vague please stop me if i'm just throwing a lot of jargon and i can explain a bit better yeah which uh, sort of handles a high level of abstraction to identify patterns and make predictions so from machine learning then came about uh, deep learning due to a number of pitfalls in machine learning is what my understanding is like uh, the the need to reduce a little bit more human intervention so that you can work with more unstructured data like texts or images and so on came about deep learning and then uh, I dove into a little bit of foundations of deep learning, then finally ended up in a domain called graph neural networks. And uh, yeah, if I can give this out to the audience, that's essentially how I met you, wherein uh, this was during my uh, phase of trying to understand graph neural networks, and there were very limited resources available. And I saw a conference called the Knowledge Graph Conference, and, that's, and I really want to participate in that. And that's how I met you as well. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for the explanation. And uh, yeah, um, that was a lovely time uh, working together to make that production a fruitful success. Um, so let's go back to the the area of biological research and healthcare. That's where you're doing your, you know, your your day in day out work now. That's the focus of your efforts today. Um, there's a couple of case studies that we had agreed to cover. And I think we can start with the machine learning use case in the space of oncology. Uh, oncology meaning cancer research. Uh, can you give us a little bit of background and um, what was the problem you were tackling and what resolution did you come out with? So uh, this is again back to uh, my thesis. So I worked on a thesis uh, where it was trying to uh, figure out an approach to cancer prediction uh, using graph neural networks. So what I mean by that is uh, what I was essentially trying to do is sort of build out a framework or a methodology wherein uh, you can take the data of a number of drugs 
which and what I mean by date of number of drugs is you have drug A and its chemical structure. You have drug B and its chemical structure, drug C and its chemical structure. And you know that drug A is effective against a certain type of cancer, which is for the sake of an example, let's say breast cancer. You know that drug A is good against good, is, is proven to work against drug, uh, breast cancer. Drug B is proven to work against breast cancer as well as prostate cancer and so on. So if you in if you give now after you build out a model and you give uh, the structure of an unknown drug, could it potentially predict what cancer this put again potentially might be effective against so that you can direct your research in a way. So the, the framework that I was trying to build is almost like a very early stage drug development uh, framework to give a researcher sort of direction to uh, sort of focus their research on. So they have, so it's it's like, you know that this unknown drug by this model may work against this drug. Now, why, why did the model predict that? Or is there any scientific background to it? So it's like how I see it as a very early stage uh, research uh, framework to go about it. Uh, sort, but, of like, uh, sort of like to automate or reinforce hypothesis around yeah. drug, drug matching drug drugs yes okay yeah so uh and uh, at the point when i was doing the uh, uh, uh this research graph neural networks was also something uh that was fairly i wouldn't say new but it was gaining in popularity and i really wanted to uh look into this as well so the project itself was a little uh, complex i'm okay talking about the project because it was my thesis project wherein uh, I took spatial data of all of these molecules, uh, sort of con vectorized the spatial data of, of the molecule, you know, how a chemical structure looks like in 3D space. This is how a molecule looks, convert that into a one or two dimensional vector, and then use that as a node of a graph. So when I say graph, graph essentially is a collection of nodes and edges. Basically, if you think of a social network, you are, or uh, any social network, if I am a friend to you on a, like if we both are friends or matches on a social network, you and I will be individual nodes and the connection is sort of uh, denoted by a link between the node that is the both of us. So very similarly in a graph structure, how I visualize this is that there will be one, one node that will be drug A another type a node that will be drug B. And these will be, again, very intuitively connected to different cancer types. So, and it was a, it was a big, it was, I would say for, uh, it was a very ambitious project for me because not only is the graph uh, heterogeneous, which means that there are different, that each node also means different things. So in the case of a social network, each node means a person, right? It can be you or I, but it means a person or the entity is a person. But in this case, one node can mean either a drug or a cancer type or any other data as well. So there's an ambitious heterogeneous graph with which I worked. Although uh, I wouldn't comment on the, uh, what you say, the accuracy of the model itself. Uh, and that's because I worked with a very small sample set to build out this framework because uh, at the time I couldn't gather, sort of mobilize the resources to get enough computational power to bring in huge pools of data to build out my model. For an, for an early stage project, I mean, the, the objective was to learn, to learn, to do, and to start uh, acclimating yourself to all these different domains. Because I think you've, you, you've just addressed three different domains right there that you were exploring simultaneously, graph neural networks. You were looking at the, the shapes of molecules of drugs that are already in market and that has a host of other um, details that come along with that. And then the yeah. cancer themselves, which is mm -hmm. how do you match the, the, the I wouldn't know how that, how, how to articulate that, but um, the, the types of cancer, their attributes mm -hmm. and things that have historically worked by looking at clinical data. Is that sort of what you were, what you were doing? Uh, no, I was looking at uh, molecule data uh, simply uh, because you you already have you already have all of these drugs that are proven against 
cancer targets, I would say, rather than the cancer itself. Okay, so you didn't, that, have an, yeah. you didn't have a, a means of uh, selecting cancer types based on a unified data reservoir. You were more looking and working backwards from the delivery and tests of the pharmacology to mm -hmm. say, okay, drug A is good for one or two, drug B yeah. is for three and four, drug exactly. C is for one and three, and then you're matching it backwards yeah. from what's been applied and tested. Okay, that yes. makes sense. You just wanted to make a map so that if anybody wants to support their patients, they have a richer mm -hmm. uh, evidence-based approach to, okay, look. To starting up their research, yeah. That's cool. That's cool. I appreciate that. That's cool. That's uh, that's the whole point of expert-driven systems, right? That's the whole point of being able to build these artificial intelligence tools, which are supposed to augment the capabilities of resource-constrained actors that have to deal with a lot of different variables. So, very cool idea. Okay, and uh, last last thing there, any lessons learned there that you can share? Uh. Uh, to be honest, that was a very exploratory project. So it was mostly about me trying to understand the domain itself rather than focusing on the outcome of the model. So well, lessons learned with working with heterogeneous data and building a graph neural network with uh, clinical clinical uh, resources. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, lessons learned... Uh, it's quite, quite, quite. Uh, what do you say? It was, it was a very challenging product uh, project, and I'm not talking about only the algorithms used, which is the graph neural network algorithm, uh, for the this link prediction model that I built. But something as simple as uh, uh, something that sounds as simple as gathering data was hugely, hugely uh, challenging because there were a lot of scattered data that I went about in different uh data sets like approved uh, approved data sets to bring about this data sort of see how all of these scattered data can be merged together to get uh you know a good good enough a high quality network that then can be passed on to a neural network so uh, at each step there were a lot of learnings that starts with the need to focus on high quality data and I understand that not always will uh, one have high quality data, but how can you, uh, like, how can you get the best data possible so that your model can also be improved? And uh, increasing the, uh, something that I realized well, very early on is that increasing the accuracy of a model uh, starts at the data step and not, it's not something that. Uh, you, can't is, fix uh, it. you can't fix it at the end. You have to exactly. start yeah. with the idea. Yes, you can't just do hyperparameter tuning at the model level to bring about to increase to expect the accuracy to increase. Wherein the problem statement lies starts with the data itself. So yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next case study, which is the you worked on clinical uh, clinical trial data for oncology and hepatology, and mm -hmm. uh, oncology we said is cancer related, hepatology yes. is uh, blood related. Right, a liver related liver. Liver. What's a uh, blood? Yet I believe you're thinking of hematology. There you go. My bad. Heme Heme being blood. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Hemoglobin. Right. Got it. Got Hemoglobin. You. Exactly. Yeah. So you worked. Um, you worked to transition some of your research into practice there, right? Uh, sorry. Can you repeat that? You were working with real clinical trial data. Yes. Yeah. And you were essentially transporting what you learned from your independent project into this domain. Yeah. So uh, I, I talk about the transition from an academic setting to uh, working in a company like GSK. When I, uh, so I, I see this as my transition from uh, when you talk about a pipeline of drug delivery or uh, dis drug discovery, you start in an academic setting to theoretically bring about uh, sort of do research on which what drug or what molecule may be effective against a disease or a target and then you in this pipeline if there is enough scientific backing to that academic research or i wouldn't say academic research that early stage research 
then you go about conducting clinical trials with a solid scientific rationale. And clinical trials being now that you have found that this particular molecule may potentially be effective against a disease, now you can, uh, with so again, emphasis on with solid scientific backing, you go about testing it on a small cohort of humans to begin with, and then it increases with each stage of this development. So I w started with the early stage and then in GSK I moved on to data that talks about the next phase of drug development. So yeah, I, as you said, I worked my first rotation. So coming back to the future leaders program, which was uh, essentially three teams, three rotations for a duration of two years. I first worked with an oncology team that worked at hepatology. Then I am currently working in a team called technical excellence and in innovation. So in oncology, so I can, I can talk about what my role in the first two teams were. It's essentially taking this clinical trial data, sort of processing or converting this data into an analysis ready form uh, and then bringing about visualization so that decisions on how effective this drug is, how if at all, if or not this drug is toxic, uh, are there any adverse events, which is any, are there any undesirable uh, consequences that are seen in patients uh, or un undesired events that are seen in patients due to potentially due to a drug? Are there any, anything like that happening uh, is visualized and sort of made decisions on later point is what I did in oncology and hepatology. Difference being I work with a particular oncological clinical trial and then moved on to a hep hepatology, a hepatological disease clinical trial. And yeah. I know that there are some things that we can and cannot talk about, so mm -hmm. I won't ask you too much, um, but uh, can you discuss any of the methodologies that you use or is that under NDA? Yes. Uh, no, so I can talk about what the uh, a little bit more specifics on the general role of what a clinical programmer is. The role uh, is called the clinical programmer role, and I can talk about what uh, that is. So, uh, so if say a person is enrolled in a clinical trial and they are taking an experimental drug to see how effective the drug is, uh, so sort of the data that is collected at a uh, let, let's say, actually, let, let me go back and set the scene. Uh, I am a patient who has disease A and I've enrolled in a clinical trial. Now I go to a center which I'm enrolled in to take this drug and the doctor or um, uh, 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 a, a qualified personnel will sort of take, sort of record down information about uh, my name, my age, uh, all, all of these metrics, they will sort of collect my ECG records, they will collect my lab, they'll collect my blood to take lab records to sort of, uh, and then uh, urine, they'll collect my urine and all of these biological uh, sort of data is recorded, the so patient. tested on and recorded, sorry. The, that's uh, the, the lab work, the lab evidence. Uh, the lab samples that is the baseline before during and after yes uh, exactly baseline yeah. yeah so the reason why you take the baseline is to see how how if if or not the drug has had an effect on all of these parameters in your body so now again uh, you are in a center enrolled in a clinical trial all of these are taken all of these data is collected and the data is sent to the company uh, who is the sponsor? So, for example, if it's GSK, GSK is a sponsor. It's called the sponsor of this clinical trial. So, the the data is sent to uh, a, a team called an SDTM team, uh, and SDTM essentially is a format for collection of or organization storage of all of these data. And I, as a clinical programmer, take this particular form of data and convert it to something called an analysis ready form. And all of these collection of data, this transfer of data and how the data is stored, uh, sort of structured, is governed by uh, a data standard structure that is set by a nonprofit organization called CDISC, which essentially is Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium. And, uh, and CDISC 
uh, is in collaboration with these regulatory bodies like the FDA in the US, EMA in Europe, which is the European Med Medicines Agency, I believe, uh, the P uh, PMDA, which is the Japanese regulatory authorities and the Chinese regulatory authorities are in collaboration with CDES to build standards uh, for collection and transfer of all of this clinical trial data. So, and uh, why is this standardization sort of important is that once uh, is, it can be uh, from, you can talk about this from a perspective of a regulatory authority, as well as the company who is in charge of the clinical trials. So for a company, it's just uh, less time consuming and uh, like there is a structure to how everything can be collected and analyzed. So there is, uh, the, the, uh, so for programmers like ourselves, uh, there is little, uh, because these data standards are already set, it's just easier for us to go about structuring the data. So there is time and money saved there. And even for regulatory authorities, when a company submits all of their data and their uh, visualizations and such, it's just easier for, let's say, an FDA reviewer to review the data because they know that it's in a set format. So they can sort of go through it a little quicker. So, which is why the need for all these data standards are brought about. And I work with a particular, as a clinical programmer, I work with a data standard called the Adam data standard, uh, which again is in a sort of a uh, sort of rules and regulations uh, rules that govern how I can trans uh, sort of uh, what do you say convert the data that I, I get into an analysis ready data, which is just easy for visualizations. Uh, yeah. So in, in a vague sense, that is what I did uh, during my first and second rotation, just that the kind of data differed because one was oncology and the other one was uh, hepatology. And I would say that the difference is that in oncology, there are, uh, there is a lot, uh, there is a different type of data that sort of corresponds to your tumor data which is how, how is your tumor responding to your drug, your experimental drug? And how you measure that is by sort of measuring the, uh, the length or breadth or dimensions of a tumor. And there are all these rules and guidelines on how you go about measuring that as well on how your tumor is responding to. Uh, Oncology would the, be the broader, and then hepatology would be a narrower subset of uh, oncology. No, so I would say that they're different in the sense that, so if, if say, yeah, there's very little, there is overlap, but I would say that an example would be an oncology is, uh, let's say you can talk about breast cancer or uh, blood cancer and so on, whereas hepatology would be any disease that particularly causes liver failure that is liver specific. Uh, I see. Yeah, but uh, I, I I do get your point. I can be overlapped. For example, you can have liver cancer that sort of can fall under both hepatology and oncology. But I would suspect that because it is a cancer, it would naturally fall under the umbrella of oncology for uh, clinical trial purposes. Thank you very much for explaining um, the C disk standard and why it's important. Um, yeah, it would be it would really suck if we had uh, individual country standards and then there's no interoperability. If you want to mm -hmm. ship drugs between one country to another for for animals for human use, um, mm -hmm. and you need to be able to understand the efficacy, the effects, the trials, it would be a huge disorder. Not to mention yeah. the differences in language differences in, 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 method, in methodologies having one standard makes it easy to ensure everybody's uh, on the same page it is and CDISC also has i believe has standards that span across this pipeline which starts with even the collection of data although i am not as familiar with that because i work i worked specifically in the analysis data rather than the collection so i believe that CDIS, there are data standards by CDIS that govern each and every step of this collection, transfer, storage uh, process, yeah. Let's talk about that uh, other case study that, that we had in, in, in the email. Technical Excellence and Innovation is the name of the of the last team, is that right, or? Uh, yes, so that is the company that I'm, uh, sorry, that is the team that I'm working in right now. I have been working in the team for four months. 
and you are, uh, as you stated, an R shiny developer. Uh, yes. So, oh, shiny uh, dashboard. Sorry. Um, yes, R shiny dashboard developer. So, uh, so with the future leaders program, where the company saw uh, that I could give the best value is that after having sort of seen all of this clinical trial data and the standards that govern it, and I've extensively worked on it. Uh, now, the technical excellence and innovation team is essentially a team that is in charge of accelerating this, this entire process, or sort of future-proofing, I would say future-proofing the biostatistics uh, vertical. So uh, right now, our shiny essentially is uh, is a web application development framework that uses the R programming language. And the team that I'm working in, and specifically the project that I'm working in, essentially uses this uh, framework called R Shiny to build interactive dashboards using so that uh, you can dive more easily into the clinical trial data that we already have. So instead of programmers having to uh, sort of cre create each and every visualization. This is just uh, we're creating dashboards so that this can be more, a little more automated and more interactively done. So it's there a, comes in, yeah. No, it's just another. It's it's another standard within this whole ecosystem of standards that allows you to build a atomic composable UIs with uh, recurring patterns that you come across. What are what are some of the use cases for the the shiny dashboard, the shiny uh, dashboard framework. Uh, a very simple use case would be that instead of, uh, let's say, uh, so the submissions for in, in a pharmaceutical detective, the submissions for FDA and let's say the Japan regulatory authorities will be a tad bit different because the Japan regulatory authorities might just want a uh, the, a subset of the population, which is the Japanese population, to be emphasized, not emphasized, they would want their outputs or their review would want emphasis on that because the regulatory authority is uh, focused on their nation. So instead of uh, a programmer having to go about creating two different uh, sort of visualizations manually, having an interactive dashboard just sort of uh, helps accelerate this process or this timeline so that you can just click a button and sort of switch between different populations is a very basic and crude example I can give you. Now, okay, I think we've covered everything that we wanted to cover in the meat and potatoes of this. Where do you see yourself moving towards in the future? And how do you see your, your skill set evolving? Uh, so, uh, so the again the realm of AI uh, MLDL is something that I haven't uh, really touched upon in the past year and a half. I would say uh, it was something that I worked extensively when I was in university and during my thesis time, and I've sort of uh, lost hands-on touch with that. Although I do keep up with the latest technologies, I do read papers, newsletters, and so on and so forth. I keep up with whatever is coming out. My hand, I, I feel like my hands on experience has uh, gone down a bit. So that is something that I look forward uh, that, That's something that I would do want to upskill in and sort of move towards. And the company has the thought of opportunities that uh, even in, within biostatistics, I can uh, think of a number of use cases wherein uh, AML is, is being used and potentially can be used as well. So, uh, yeah moving slowly moving towards uh moving back towards it perhaps would be a better way of saying it is yeah it's on, it's on my mind and uh like if you were to give yourself advice from where you started in terms mm -hmm. of picking up uh, machine learning what are observations that you can share with the audience that can help them on their journey to pick up these uh techniques uh i i would say again I, I keep coming back to curiosity and uh, exploration. So uh, a lot, I feel like I, because my background didn't have my degree, did not have an extensive programming background, uh, uh, like me having explored 
AML sort of brought about a little bit of programming expertise, which made me, which sort of accidentally made me eligible uh, for the, my role at GSK. It's not something that I prepared for. It's just in exploration. I just built up my skills. My basket just kept on filling and uh, GSK identified uh, me as a potential candidate for this program. Or even I would say the way I met you, if I wouldn't have explored, uh, gone about doing my exploration i wouldn't probably be here as a guest speaker on this podcast so yeah i uh, like with all the structure that uh, all these courses provide on the internet for aiml or whatever it's great to follow that but just keep the bigger picture in mind and sort of explore is what i would say and get you places now, in, in the context of bioinformatics, biostatistics, uh, biotechnology, uh, what are some observations that you can share with people that are just starting to get into the, the domain? And, you know, there, there probably is a lot of information they need to take in to be, to be able to navigate. What are some of the foundational pillars that they can use as guiding posts? Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say that exploration with respect to biotechnology is a little more uh, difficult because biotechnology entails a lot of lab work and not something that you can just uh, do by yourself. So that would involve a lot of, uh, I, I would say, a lot of networking, look, looking at the right places and figuring, figuring out the labs that you want to look into because biotechnology, to be honest, takes a lot of resources and not all uh, companies or labs have the resources to facilitate biotechnological products. So. Uh, as as soon as you get your uh, grounds like as soon as you get your ground running to network so that at least for biotechnology it, i cannot understate the uh, importance of networking even outside of biotechnology as well and for bioinformatics i i would say uh, for someone i assume that if you did take biotechnology as your niche you already have an inclination for the intersection of computer science and programming so again I would come back to my exploration and curiosity uh, sort of point for bioinformatics and biostatistics as well. Yeah. In terms of uh, working with clinical trial data, um, what are some some nuances that people need to take into consideration? You said if you don't deal with quality data, you might get garbage out. You know, mm -hmm. garbage in, garbage out. Quality in, quality mm -hmm. out. So, how do you deal with? Uh, making sure that the data you're working with, particularly clinical trial data, is of a high quality? Uh, so uh, so from the perspective of a clinical programmer, sort of the data that you get is just the data that you get. And you have to go back and forth with the upstream and downstream teams to uh, get that rectified. But uh, I, I feel like there, there are, uh, what do you say? There are a lot of times when uh, you would see data and you just don't understand it. And it might come from, don't just assume that it's not a data quality issue or it's from a lack of your expertise or anything. I, I would say just ask questions. I feel like that's something that a manager of mine, uh, a tip that a manager of, an advice that a manager of mine gave uh, at, at the very early stage wherein don't blanket uh, apply data standards to the quality that you have. Always question your data uh, so that you, at, at the end, what is important is uh, your the patient's health and that your drug comes out with the best quality or the best results. Your your drug come your drug is in the market with the most accurate uh, result and the most safest drug comes to market. So do not just blanket for as at least I'm talking about as a clinical about this as a clinical program. Don't blanket apply your data standards and assume your data is perfect. Always go through your data, always scrutinize your data. And then again, coming this also comes back to the idea of stakeholder management, where always just keep an open communication with all the downstream and upstream teams is something that you, you can do to ensure data quality. Attention detail, stakeholder management, communication, scrutinize. You made a very particularly interesting point earlier on, and I didn't address this, but I now I think it's appropriate for me to bring it up. You said you need to have 
very good problem definition, right? That's mm -hmm. the whole point. That has far-reaching impacts into everything that you're going to do with your time, with the resources of the company you're working with, with everybody else you're, you're, you're going to give work to. How do you go about identifying the quality of a problem statement or a problem definition? So when you're working in a company, and I found this to be particularly, this point to be particularly uh, important with the current team that I'm working in, which is in charge of bringing about innovation within our vertical or within our function, is sort of you will you will have if if you are a naturally curious person, you will want to explore uh, ten different things. But it's it's very important that you narrow down when you, especially when you're uh, working for a big company or any company that has its budgets and resources, it's important that you, uh, from the 10 ideas that you have, you narrow down to your most high value uh, idea. And what I mean by high value is uh, bang for the buck would be one thing to be put very crudely. Like, uh, like, uh, and what that means is that how, how much, uh, money does this particular idea of your sort of innovation that you're bringing about or you're putting forward is going to save for the company or how is it going to accelerate the timelines or, or in a much more broader perspective i'm talking about from a very narrow perspective in a much more broader perspective acceleration of any timeline or any innovation that you bring that are high value is essentially essentially means that good drugs come to market quicker and patients are uh, sort of this market, uh, this drug gets to patients quicker. And again, that's important for a fight against any disease, right? So identify your high value uh, ideas are the most, what do you say, pragmatic ideas. It shouldn't be so far-fetched that you spend six months uh, exploring and uh, you sort of failing uh, with nothing to show. And one general rule of thumb in pharma is first to fail. Well, if you see something going wrong, or uh, if, if you see that this is not taking a, de a desired route, terminate it quickly, do your risk assessment and terminate it uh, quickly. Because in pharma, especially a lot of a lot of capital and investment goes into, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, a lot of capital goes into the pipeline. So first to fail is a uh, standard principle for pharma. And I think that applies to any stage. This yeah, a very focused, pragmatic, bang for the buck approach to the 10 ideas that you have so that you can add them down. I appreciate that you you stated, and not a lot of uh, technical folk um, have this mindset, but I appreciate that you stated tying the hypothesis to an outcome. There needs mm -hmm. to be an outcome. My understanding yeah. is that there's only three levers to pull in a business setting. You have increased revenue, reduce expenses, or increase uh, the you know how many customers you can satisfy at one time. If you can pull multiple levers in one hypothesis, great. But usually those are one of the three that incentivize an organization to even undertake an initiative. Um, it's much better. I also, thank I, you. Yeah. I, I also appreciate that uh, new concept that for for me at least, first to fail. If you see that it's going to go wrong, chop it off. No need to uh, you know, get rid of the sunk costs, but at least you can maximize the learnings at an early stage and prevent yourself from hemorrhaging more money. Um, exactly. As an early career individual, something that I'm learning right now is uh, risk assessment and having mitigation plans for uh, you know things. And that, again, would, would also come back to open communication and planning ahead. But yeah, that's something that I'm learning right now as so i'm going through this phase in my career yeah Raul, you're a sharp guy and uh this conversation just shows how quickly your brain can work and how much you prepared and how well you know your domain um do you have any last words to the audience uh i would always come back to uh, uh this, this is something that i that is my instagram bio as well which is cake and conversations which is have good cake have Build your network, have good conversations with people so that you're not constrained to, uh, your horizon is not limited, but you see uh, things at a much broader sense. And 
a very last thing that is not technical or related to AI in any way, but uh, something that is important to me, and I think everyone sh it should be important to everyone is just to be empathetic, and that will get you and other people places. Yeah. What's your favorite cake? Oh, uh, <laughs> it's a pretty basic cake. It's called the Black Forest. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you know, it's just chocolate, vanilla, chocolate, cream, this layers of chocolate and cream, and that's it. It's a very basic cake, but I love it. I have way too many stories on how I went about cities trying Black Forest, just Black Forest, an entire day. Sounds delicious. Um, it is. <laughs> my uh, my mother-in-law, she makes this uh, cake where she soaks raisins in uh, wine for like mm -hmm. one or two weeks i don't even know but the 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 texture the flavors that it brings out after soaking it for so long you're gonna have to try it uh, i'll ask her for the recipe is, and i'll send it to you is this an all year thing over christmas uh a festivity she, she, does, festivity. It, she does it for holidays for, yeah festivities or, or somebody's birthday uh okay. my girlfriend I'm... my girlfriend's more creative she can make I mean, she's made pumpkin cheesecake. We we've made um, carrot and 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 Guinness, carrot mm -hmm. and Guinness beer uh, cake. We we go a little crazy in the kitchen. Uh, lychee and pineapple, uh, little cupcakes. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyways, we could talk a whole hour on on desserts, but uh, but you're just, gonna... I'm going to invite when I'm in New Jersey. I'm just inviting myself to your place. I'm sorry. Oh, don't be sorry. You're more than welcome. <laughs> Anyways, Raul, thank you very much for coming on and, and thank you for teaching us about clinical trial data, clinical data, biostatistics, bioinformatics, and your lovely background. Um, I hope this serves uh, to guide people that are curious and passionate to see that there is a way forward and the, the things that they do today is going to have a, a far reaching impact into their future. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Thank you.